congratulations on completing week one of Foundations of Algorithms. In the first week, we met your tutors and your teaching staff, Jan Jong and I. Then we went on to discuss why algorithms and the Enigma machine that gave us motivation for developing an algorithm to find repeated sequences of letters in a string. We looked at a number of different methods for doing so and then proceeded with an analysis of each of these methods, stepping through the algorithm step by step. We looked at big O notation and did an elementary proof of the runtime. Worst case and best case analysis followed by our very first data structure, a suffix array. We then learnt about a shell, compiled our first program, Hello World, and we're done for the week. Today, to celebrate International Women's Day, we have a new figure up on the board. Does anyone know who this is? Quick shout out if you do. Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace, that's correct. She was one of the early pioneers of computer science, considered to be the mother of computing, and had to have developed the first algorithm, which makes her a very prescient choice for our presentation here today. In fact, there is also a programming language named after her called the Ada Programming Language. So today we are going to be continuing on with our Hello World exercises and computers in the universe and covering a little bit more of the language. Hopefully by the end of the week, Liam is also going to upload a presentation on uh, the C programming language that covers a few more of the details. We're just going to go through some of the highlights in lectures with the rest of the skills that you'll gain through your workshops and through uh, the book and hopefully through Liam's lecture as well. So a brief overview of what we're going to be doing. Chapter 2, 3, and 4, we're going to cover this week. Basic order of operations, types, arithmetic operations, and control flow. This means if statements, else statements, and loops. Uh, the very key building blocks that all of you are familiar with from other programming languages, we're going to do a recap of how those work in C, and some new things about computers that you'll learn by learning them in C. There we go. Um, so the C language has a whole bunch of operators. Some of them are arithmetic, some of them are logic, some of them are comparison. There are a whole lot of them here. Let me, for the projector, see if I can drag away some of the... Uh, no, I can't see this well enough. <laughs> Liam, if you want, you can handle the annoying uh, bar up the top. Um, but we have a whole bunch of different operations there. Our class is going to focus on the arithmetic operations that should animate, uh, the plus, minus, division, and multiplication signs, and the logic operator and the logic and comparison operators over here. So equals equals, which is a com uh, comparison for equality, greater than, smaller than, greater than or equal to, greater than or smaller than. You get the picture. I still can't click. There we go. So the arithmetic operators and the comparison operators. The next key thing about C that's a little different is explicit use of types. In a number of other languages, types are implicit. implicit. For example, in Python, if you say number equals three, Python automatically recognizes that you're talking about a number on the other side, or x equals three, for a better example that's less confusing. However, in C, you actually need to specify, is the number you're talking about an integer? Is it a floating point number, one type of decimal, or a double, another type of decimal? And which of these choices you make for your integers impacts what the operations actually do. For example, if you try and add together a string and a, I'm getting some feedback now, um, feedback on the microphone. Maybe just too loud or clipping. Um, for example, if you add a string together with a number, you will get an error in C, whereas uh, Python, no, don't actually remember off the top of my head what happens, but Python, uh, if you multiply a string in Python, there's a better example. If you multiply the string high by three in Python, you get high, high, high. In C, no such thing works. Types are enforced a little more strictly. So. Moving on to some of the actual types in C. All manner of technical difficulties today. 
OK, mouse on the small screen. The first type we're going to look at is a type that corresponds to the American Standard Code for Information I Interchange. This is the char. A char holds a single character of value between 0 and 127. Now, that sounds a little strange. Characters aren't between 0 and 127. They're between like A and Z. Well, it turns out that computers don't naturally have a way to represent letters. If you draw a letter inside your computer on the motherboard, nothing's going to happen. The computers, as all of you know, operate on electrical impulses, which correspond to ones and zeros. So we need some way of matching a given pulse of ones and zeros with a given uh, type of meaning that we as humans use. The most common signifier of meaning that humans use is, of course, the alphabet, uh, whether that be the Roman, the Arabic humans use. The most common signifier of meaning that humans use is, of course, the alphabet, uh, whether that be the Roman, the Arabic, the Chinese, or any other. So we need some way of mapping the numbers to the alphabet that we're using. And ASCII, the, this American standard, is one such way. In the corner, which is covered by a little bar at the top, we have the null byte. This is a zero. It doesn't actually represent any character in our mapping, except for the empty character, which will turn out to be really useful in the C language, as we'll see. And then when we get to 65 over there, we have the letter A, capital. Before that, we have a whole bunch of different characters. We have our numbers, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have to memorize this. The computer, the C compiler, does this translation for you. However, knowing about the existence of this underlying mapping will help to explain some of the behaviors of the C compiler when you start to go about. And furthermore, it gives you a closer insight into what's actually happening under the hood when you're programming. There we go. Easy. Uh, but what about doing maths? Uh, that should be even easier than characters. We don't have to do any of this funny mapping stuff, right? Uh, not exactly. Uh, how much memory does a computer have? Anyone? Depends. Depends? Give me, give me a guess. 16, 16 gig. 16 gig. That's a very small computer. Maybe for RAM. Um, either way, um, computers are finite, which means that if we want to store numbers inside them, we're going to quickly run out of room if we allow to store bigger and bigger numbers. We'll get some more of that for a second. But for the time being, let's imagine a clock. And the clock is going to represent um, a number inside our computer. And so we start, oh, there we go. Looks much better. Uh, so starting at 12 up the top, um, let's make that our zeros place. And we'll count 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Great. Uh, if that's our, the way we're going to store numbers, what happens when we get back to the top, when we get past 11? And now we've clicked off again. We run into a problem. So part of the question I want to ask here is, is there a limit to high, how high this computer can count? Well, obviously, this one only gets up to 12. But what about your desktop computer? Is there a limit to how high your computer can count? Shout it out, because we're missing the microphone today. Depends on the type. Depends on the type. Anyone else? Is there a limit to how high a computer can count? Two to the 64, that's another uh, reasonable observation. OK, well, let's explore this a little further. This is a more accurate representation of what's actually happening inside our computer. We're slowly going to strip away some of the layers going from our clock analogy to the actual representation of a number inside the computer. Starting at 0, we're again counting 1, 2, 4, 8. But inside the computer, we don't have numbers between like 1 and infinity. Instead, we've got our bits. So let's represent these by 1s and zeros. And if we have 31, uh, 32 ones and zeros, then that number over there is 2 to the 31. Um, that number is going to be 0. That's going to be 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3. And using a conversion from binary to our decimal numbers, we can fill out this, whole, this clock with all the numbers in between, uh, excluding the, uh, we're only talking about integers in this mapping. I'll get rid of those little dots for next time I present this. 
So here's our representation. Uh, we go from zero to two to the zero, to two to the two, to two to the three, to two to the four, and so on and so forth. Um, noting that this is now one, that is now, what's that number? Two, that number? Four, eight, et cetera, et cetera. And the numbers in between are now represented here by the markings. And now Renata is coming to rescue us with the microphone. Thank you very much. Everyone give a round of applause. Thank you. And now for a brief intermission. Hopefully it won't be that long. But feel free to chat. Test, test, test. This needs to be on. Test, 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 test. There we go. OK, uh, shout out on Zoom if you can't hear me. And where did my clicker go? I have that. I was holding that half a second ago. There we go. OK, now we're back. And hopefully the people in Zoom can hear me without me having to shout into the camera over there. Um, oh, no. Now I clicked off again. There we go. Um, so that gets us all the way from 0 to 2 to the 32 minus 1. Why does it get us to 2 to the 32 minus 1? The previous slide. Why can't we get all the way to 2 to the 32? What happens when we get to the 32? We get back to 0. So we've gone all the way around the clock, and we get back to 0. Um, so this is what happens if we have 32 bits that we're using to represent a number. So when you hear people talk about a 32-bit computer, or a 64-bit computer, what they're talking about is that inside the computer, every number that's being represented is being represented using these, um, using 32 or using 64 bits. And the maximum that one of those numbers can count up to is either 2 to the 32 minus 1 or 2 to the 64 minus 1. Liam, I, I need my next slide. There we go. OK. Um, and so this is all great for our positive numbers, but what about our negative numbers? Any ideas? There's a, there was a big hint on the screen. No, the one with the clock. There we go. There's our hint. Um, so what happens when we want to represent negative numbers? What can we do? Add a negative sign. Where, where can a computer store a negative sign in a bit? Bits of ones and zeros. Good try, though. Anyone else? And remind me your name again. Borsia. 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 I'll get it next time. Well, send, send me an email with it written out, and maybe I'll do a better job. OK, so that was a great idea. We'll use half our clock over here as the negative numbers and half our clock over here as the positive numbers. And we know that this half happens when the leftmost digit, in this case, in this depiction, is a 1. So this is the, uh, let's call this the 32nd place because um, it's 32 along from that right-hand side. The 32nd place, when it's a 1, we'll call all those numbers negative. And to make our lives a little easier when we're actually doing some of the actual computation on this, we'll explore this again, I think, in week 11, we're actually going to put our the start of our negative numbers over here and go all the way down to halfway. So negative 1, negative 2, negative 4, negative 8, et cetera, until they meet in the middle and overlap. So the largest positive number is halfway down, and the largest negative number is also halfway down, and they meet at the middle. And the smallest number, which is 0 for both, is right there. Um, but 2 to the 32 is a little small. I, I think it was someone on Zoom said that uh, it can hold maximum 2 to the 64. Well, even if we go up to 2 to the 64, that's still, still a relatively small number. I mean big in terms of us, but this is a computer. Surely it should be able to count higher than to the 64. Um, well, there, there's our solution for the 32 bit. But this is still not big enough. Any ideas? How can we count to larger than 2 to the 64 minus 1 on the computer? Yes. yes. And, and name. name. Yeah. yeah. Vincent. 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 Scientific notation, how are we going to store that? Um, you can have uh, like the um, tens of power something and the numbers, and uh, the, uh, the other bits, just like 
So that's, that's not, not a bad, bad idea. idea. We could uh, get two different clocks to each other, and one of them will represent the we're in, and the other one can represent some other digits. That's one way, but that will only allow, that'll give us quite limited precision. That'll give us two to the 64 in, uh, in front of the scientific notation, and then we'll be able to multiply given power. Not bad, that's a really good idea. And we'll see that something similar is actually done much later in the course for floats and for doubles. But uh, along the same line of thought, we could just add more clocks. When we get to two to the 64 minus one on one of them, we'll put a one on the second clock, and then we can start counting, counting again. When we've gone around another two to the 64, we'll bump and go before again, et cetera, et cetera. You can see that by combining the clocks together, we can get much, much higher numbers. But can we get as high as we like? Yes, no. Hands up for yes, uh, hands on shoulders for no. Or type it in the Zoom chat. No, why no? Someone who hasn't answered yet. You over there, sorry. And give me your name as well. Lauren. Where's the limit come from? Well, well, you're right, but let's find out why you're right. Okay, uh, we can do this for negative numbers as well. Um, C is smart enough to deal with all this complexity, right? It's going to be able to handle growing number of each time? Well, uh, not exactly. C is, go we're going to actually have to tell C each time we want to use a larger number. So at the smallest, we have a char, which a sign char can only store a number between zero and 127. That's using a very small number of bits. Um, and then next up, we can tell C to use a short, um, which is normally double an int, but we don't know that, double a char. Then we can tell C, no, that's still not enough room Make it an int, make it two to the 32. Still not big enough? What about a long two to the 64 normally? Well, that's all good, but every computer is built differently and the C compiler only gives us a guarantee that this equality holds. It's not even enough to guarantee us a two to the 64 minus one counting. Um, so this is what it does guarantee. It guarantees these values here. A char contains at least uh, 256 for an unsigned char which means that we're using all the bits and using any of them for negative. A short, at least two to the 16 values, an int two to the 16 and two to the 32 for long. So we're not even getting our two to the 64. Um, and the problem gets worse when we move to things with decimal points. Uh, how many, this is, so this is another question for all of you. To how many decimal points can a computer represent a random real number? And this is building on what we've been talking about. So. We'll have the grand reveal of the answer shortly. Someone new again. Infinite? We can represent a random number to infinite places. Oh, sorry, Xinjiang. Yeah, a random number can have infinite digits. If we use every atom inside the computer, are there enough atoms to represent every digit of an infinite number? That should be a pretty clear answer to all of you. No, of course not. So this is where we start getting into some of the questions about the way that computers interface with, oh, where's my beautiful visualization? Interface with the universe at large. In fact, if we used all the atoms in the universe, our computer would still be constrained to the uh, largest number that it can count or to the length of precision to which it rep can represent a floating point number. In fact, if we were to try and cram more and more information into a smaller and smaller computer to allow it to count higher and higher and higher, it would eventually get a black hole. It turns out that the universe provides fundamental limits to how high a computer can actually count and how precise it can actually get. And this is why, going back to us programming language, why we must suffer through limited precision and why our integers only count up to a certain maximum. Even when you're used to using Python and not thinking about these things or using another program, uh, programming language, these details are being hidden from you. They're still there. There is a maximum size to which your computer can count. 
And by teaching you C, one of the things that we aim to do is expose you to these limits and help you to understand it. In fact, these limits are written about in many academic papers. Here are a couple of them. Uh, the talk of this one in particular, I think is really interesting, perhaps for when you get uh, a little more mature in your computer science, that talks about the many ultimate physical limits to computation. In fact, it's not just the precision or the amount of memory that computers are bounded by, it's also speed. We're bounded by the speed of light and by other physical elements of the universe that characterize how quickly information is transmitted and manipulated. And this is why I find this course personally so satisfying, is because in a kind of hidden way, it does gesture and does point to these ultimate questions about our place in the universe and the way it's constructed. But uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to move uh, much more concretely into C for the next few lectures. And we'll talk about some of the standards and specifications that we use to get around some of these fundamental limits and to allow you to actually perform computation. So we are finite, but how finite are we inside a computer? Well, this is where C runs into trouble when you actually start programming. You're going to discover very quickly something integer overflow. Um, and floats and doubles, the types of uh, decimal place numbers that you're going to be using, will also have these precision issues. As I mentioned in one of the other lectures, try to find 10 and then dividing it by 10, you'll quickly find that the answers aren't always what you expect. So uh, that said, I'm going to have to ask a permission and forgiveness from all of you who are students of the mathematical sciences, because we are going to make a complete muck of mathematical notation in the next few slides. So uh, handing this one off to the audience and to Zoom again, let's assume that we're in our funny little mathematical group. We're in our clock world. And our clock world goes up to 2 to the 32, and we're using integers. What happens if I divide? one by two, and all I have is this clock that counts from one to two to the 32 minus one. Actually, that probably should be minus one, but anyway. What happens? One by two, and using this funny representation. Zero, why would it be zero, and who said that? Name. Say again. How? Why would it be zero? Just to get rid of the, uh, the decimal part. So, so that's an explanation of what it does, but why it does is a little interesting. The representation that we're using for our numbers, the integer type in C, only uses this kind of representation that's like clock. In the clock representation, there's no space for floating point numbers for decimal places. The way that we've chosen to store our numbers inside the computer means that there's actually a limitation to the way that it processes them, the kinds of operations we can do to produce a given result. Now, of course, there is a way around this. We do have decimal place types in C. We have the float and the double. But we'll have to tell the computer to use those if we want to change the way that it's storing the numbers and then to give us the results that we actually expect from an operation like this. Um, so there are a few possible ways that the computer could handle such a situation. Uh, way number one is for the computer to just declare uh, that this is something that's not allowed, it doesn't make sense, and throw an error. Way number two is to answer if there are numbers because the computer is smart and can guess what the programmer actually means. This is what modern versions of Python do. Now, this is a little problematic because you don't always want the computer to guess what your intentions are. After all, if we're using the C programming language or writing our operating system, we want to actually have the computer do what we tell it to do. So number two is probably a little risky as well. Uh, number three, we could just leave the answer as the input. So instead of, if I ask the computer, what is one divided by two? The computer could just say it is one divided by two. That doesn't give us very much progress, at least for the kinds of operations we commonly try to do. We could say is one remainder two. That's another option, but C takes the last option and just gives the quotient at the end, giving us a final answer of zero. The reasons why are a little more complex than we have to, the reason why C makes this decision is a little more complex than we have time to get into. Um, but you'll come to appreciate 
throughout the course that this is one of many logical answers that the compiler to make the language consistent, coherent, and close to the way that the computer actually represents the numbers. So here's a different one. Now let's say that I have a special set, and we'll call this set. And this is going to contain floating point numbers to a limited precision. What is one divided by 2.5? Yes. Yes, so that's the mathematician's answer. This, this doesn't necessarily make sense. For those on Zoom, the, give me your name again. I oh, should remember, should remember that one by now. I've asked you a few times. So the, the mathematical answer that the hopefully many of you ought to be giving is that this makes no sense. You can't divide something from two different sets or two different mathematical objects uh, because they're not the same object. This, this doesn't make sense. However, uh, as computer programmers, we're a little bit more practical. And this time, we actually do decide to give an answer. Um, so the three different options, if for this case, Decide it doesn't make sense, throw an error and crash. Uh, number two, we could approximate the real number because this is going to be a real number uh, as a result. We could approximate it by an integer, which is, is one other option that would uh, be a little questionable. Or number three, we could with a mostly equivalent real. So real numbers have infinite precision. If, if I give you the number 2.0, 2.0 is really 2.00000000. It's infinite precision, which we've already agreed in this class that our computer can't handle. Um, and so one option is to just give it our best shot and give it, say, a fixed number of places or give it a scalable precision and uh, give it the best shot and our best approximation. And number three is what actually uh, systems do. And you'll find that even Python, when it comes down to it, has limited precision. But uh, as Admiral Akbar says, this is all a trap. And this is because uh, when you're doing mathematical operations on a computer, typically as humans who are used to dealing with uh, nice clean mathematics, we're expecting precise answers. And so when we write code, if we don't anticipate these kinds of problems, we run into trouble really fast. But our C compiler does give us a little bit of help. This is a chart showing type cohesion. This is where we have a situation like the one we had before, where we have one 2.5 and one is an integer and 2.5 is a float. That chart that I have there shows that C actually does recognize some coercion. It will force the type that is uh, less flexible into a type that's potentially more flexible. And here I'm using the term flexible very flexibly. Um, so a Boolean, which is a type that is just making its way into a new version of C starting next year, uh, it's either it's one bit, either true or false. And that, if it gets, uh, if you have some operation between a bool and a character or a bool and an integer, uh, the integer wins out. The, re the result will be converted into the, what, whichever thing is bigger. If we have a war or an, an operation, I should say, between a character and a float, the character will get, oh, I think that one might actually not work. Let's take a different example. If we have an operation between an int and a float, uh, the float will win out and the result will be in the form of a float. And this allows us at least this extra little bit of flexibility that makes programming not insanely difficult. Otherwise, every time we do one of these operations, we'd have to explicitly tell the computer, exactly what we're starting in and what we want to convert it to and how we want to convert it. There are also programming languages that do maintain this strictness and there are benefits to using them. One of them that was popular at this university was Haskell. And the reason why it was so popular is to do mathematical proof as long with your programs, as long as you accurately and don't start misrepresenting it in the crazy way we're doing. But, Fortunately for all of you, we're in Sea land and not in Haskell land. And so we will have this little bit of extra flexibility for our uh, course. Okay, now let's do a little bit of a demo. That's a whole lot of talking from me. Um, and let's see how this actually works out when we try a program. Okay. So here is a program I prepared earlier. 
Oh, that does not look like a program. Uh, I have a funny feeling that I accidentally overwrote the program with a compiled version of it. There we go. <laughs> okay. So here is our program overflow.c that we're going to use to represent some of these problems. Now, that text is awfully hard to read in these colors. So I will change the color for next time. Or let's see if we can load it in VS Code and make it a little more palatable. Here is our code. OK. In this program, we're declaring a number of different integer types. We have big. BP1, BT2, BPT2. So the P's and the T's just stand for plus and times. So uh, big plus one is going to be the first thing we'll print out, then big times two, and then we're going to print out big plus one times two. And I want some guesses from all of you uh, as to what the outcomes will be. So what will, if we just print, big, will that number print on screen properly? Shout out. Yes, it'll print out properly, we hope. Okay, what about uh, B, uh, BP1, so big plus one. Does anyone recognize this number or have a guess at what it might be? Two to the 32, Two to the 32 minus one. So this is getting dangerously uh, close to the top of our clock. We expect something to happen when we hit the end. Then BT2, we're going to go all the way around the clock and halfway again. And then what happens if we get all the way around the clock because we've gone uh, the largest number plus one. So we're back at the start of the clock and multiply it by two. Think in your head what will happen. And we will reveal the answer momentarily. There we go. I think I will change this to a white background with black text next time. Now let's compile the program. Now, before I press enter, I want to point out one or two elements here. So I'm using some flags. Flags are options that you can give a program that change its behavior. In this case, I'm using dash O, which tells the compiler that I want the output from the program to be named something specific. I'm telling it that I want an input of overflow.c. I've got this strange C flags variable, and then I have overflow. Uh, I want the output from my program to be overflow. What is C flags, you ask? Well, this is a variable that I prepared earlier, and your tutors can hopefully show you how to make one like this. But it looks a little ugly, so I didn't want to type it out. That is what C flags is. It is a whole bunch of different options that I've asked my compiler to institute when I compile. And instead of typing this out every time, inside the shell, the program that runs the compiler, I've stored this variable so that I can reuse it. In hopefully an additional video that I'll upload to the LMS, I will go through and explain some of these flags and why you might want to use them. But I strongly, strongly encourage you with, with all my heart and all my soul to use some of these flags because the more of these flags you use, the less questions you'll have for your tutors and for me because your code will work more frequently. And when it doesn't, the flags will tell you why. And we'll see in just a second, there is one of these flags that I've enabled that'll help us see what's going wrong with our code. So clang. And you'll notice here that the order doesn't matter. Overflow.c and dash o overflow. Now, the order does matter sometimes when compiling. We're not going to talk about it, but just know that the facts that it can happen and that can be an issue. OK, now there we go. We have a warning, but it did work. What does the warning say? Uh, the warning says unknown warning option. OK, I guess my there was a problem with my flags. Uh, too many flags. Yeah.
Hmm, no warning message. So one of those flags was meant to give the right warning, but we will find that for next time. Anyway, we'll give it a run and see what happens. As expected, when we get to, with a signed integer, that is an integer that can store negative numbers, when we go over two to the 30, uh, when we go over two to the 30 minus one um, to the next number, we get the last negative number. Then if we were to multiply that by two, so think of the clock where one over from, uh, where, sorry, where one less than halfway, if we multiply one less than halfway by two, we end up two steps away from the very end and two steps away from the very end a clock that has negative two on that side, two steps away from the end gives us negative two. And then if I take uh, halfway along and I go halfway along and go all the way and double it, so half plus another half gets us back to the top, we get zero. And while uh, this may be a little confusing, if you visualize the clock back in your head and think, okay, where in the clock am I? It'll help become a little clearer to you why the code is working the way it does. Okay. Um, so there'll be a bunch of code demos that I'm going to upload to the LMN after and all those programs over there. Uh, hopefully by the end of the week, there'll be a video explaining each of these examples and showing how they relate to different elements of the C programming language. In overflow.c, which we won't cover again in the videos, uh, if you download the program, the links are all in the slides that'll be available. You can replicate this behavior for, its, for yourself. Give it a try. We'll also see the impact of this numerical storage format on rounding. We are going to look at the order of operations, how to format different types, because if you want to print out an integer as opposed to a float, you're going to need to give printf different strings. And then finally, type coercion, this thing we were talking about where C forces one value into another. And look for those values on the, look for those videos on the LMS, hopefully by the end of this week. Here is a little program that we're going to do in live code now in the last few minutes of, actually, well, we'll skip that one. I'll put it up on the LMS in the video as well. And we have a challenge pro two different challenge programs for you. One is to uh, write a program that gives the volume of a sphere. And the other one is to do a conversion between pounds and kilos. Another thing that we're going to ask you to do in all your programs, every time there is a magic number, that is a number that is probably not going to change very frequently, some kind of constant, something that's central to either the, the nature of mathematics or the uh, structure of something you're talking about, we're going to ask you to use a hash define. A hash define is a macro. This is a small program that your computer runs before it actually does the compiler and does like a find replace inside your code. So for example, if I do hash define, um, go. So let's say that the size of a car is fixed. Every car in the universe is uh, 35 kilograms. So a little small for a car, but we're talking miniaturized cars of the, of the future. What I can do is up here at the start of my program, I can send this instruction to the preprocessor, this program that runs before the compiler and tell it every time you see car size, I want you to replace it with 35 because 35 is the nature of a car. It's not gonna change. So you can just do a find and replace. Now, if one day in the future, our super fancy cars get better and now they're only 20 kilos, I can then go to the top of my program and very easily change that to 20. And now if I do GCC,
it'll tell me 20 kilos. And having that useful hash define at the top is good programming practice because it allows you to separate the bits of the program that are innate values that you might need to specify as part of the, the specification of a program and the bits that are actually operational. Um, and often helps to detect errors. Now, um, there is also op order of operations in C. It's kind of like BODMAS or BOMDAS you did in high school, only there are much, uh, much more operations than the ones you're used to. At highest precedence, we have some operations over here going down to lowest. And the video will upload for later in this week. You'll see that if you fail to correctly specify the right order of operations in a program, again, you'll get the wrong answers. That. A couple of pitfalls also when it comes to order of operations that are unique to C as well. The precedence rules don't always tell you exactly which thing the computer is going to do in what order, because you might have two things of the same precedence. An example is here is A times B plus C times D. If we go back to our prior slide, you'll see that plus is lower precedence than multiplication, as it should be, but we have two of them. So which of these two will happen first? Unclear. The compiler doesn't specify. And if C and if multiplying C and D or multiplying A and B affect each for some reason, because these are variables, so they can, we'll end ourselves up in deep water. Precedence only tells you in C what comes later, not necessarily what comes earlier. Uh, and there's no sound, so we'll leave that for the later. In the last few minutes of the lecture, we're finally going to get to control structures. Finally, what if? Well, C, of course, does have operators. They're a little different from Python in that there's no L if. Instead, we've got else if. And the way it works is instead of Python's white space, we're using these curly brackets that hopefully all of you have seen in the few sample programs and hopefully in the program that you have been programs that you've all been busy writing yourself at home. Um, and everything in these blocks indicated by the curly brackets is treated as that same little section of code that is controlled by one of these operators like if or else. Um, one of the interesting things is that logical and relational operators in C actually produce a value. They're integer types. So if I do a comparison, what is five, let's say I write five bigger than four. What is the value of five bigger than four in Python? What would it be? True. What about in C? One. That's correct. In Python, a comparison results in something, a Boolean value that's either true or false. In Python, this is no longer true. We get a truthy value because C treats everything larger, everything other than zero as truthy, which means uh, it acts like true, and zero is treated as falsy, but it's not actually the values of true and false. Um, and so this is going to be another hiccup that you'll find in your code. The Boolean type the true and false does exist in C, but only really as of next year. There were workarounds to get it into your program earlier, um, and it did actually just mean one and zero, but uh, the practice that will be used in the book and in the class will be that true and false don't really exist independently of truthiness and falsiness of integer values. And this is because it's only in the C standard as of next year. Um, C is white space insensitive, as I showed you in the other class. You can jam this all together on one line as long as you mark things out by our little curly brackets. Um, or you can actually use a colon instead. You're feeling very risky and your block is only one line long. I say this does not mean you should. Uh, it's actually quite a risky thing to do, as we'll see in one more slide before we get to the end. So this is a sample program that uses if and else. You can see our little, uh, wait a minute, our blocks are using uh, our three, three different structures. So our first one is just a one statement block. This is what I said, you can use a colon. Don't do this, this is just for show. Our first line over here, n equals one. If n is less than zero, print it was negative. That is attached to the prior if statement because it is a single statement with a colon after. Then we have another separate if. If n is equal to zero, 
print it zero. And then we have an else if that's attached to this if. So the two ifs are not attached to each other because if, an, and for it to be attached, the original if would have had to have been followed to an else. So these two run separately. Our else over here, however, is attached to that if because it is the block that immediately is subsequent to the original if block. Um, so else if n is greater than zero, print n is small. And you can, this program will also be available for you to run on your own. Um, one thing that's really, really important to note is that in C, just like in many languages, we have a different operator to set something equal to something to else than to check if something is equal to something else. This is the double equals sign operator is our equality comparison operator. If you get this wrong, if you have a single equal sign, you have not turned on every single warning that the compiler has, your code will compile, but it will probably give you an answer you don't expect. And the reason is that C, uh, that n equals equals zero, because of comparison, it produces a value that is a zero or one. Remember, zero for a falsy, one for truthy. Um, but if we set n equal to zero, that's an assignment, and assignments actually produce a result in C. They produce the result of things. Uh, if I set n equal to five, the result of set n is five. This is a property of some languages, particularly C. So if you leave out this equal sign, what's the value of n equals zero? If I run just that line of code, what do I get? Zero, yes, exactly. n equals zero is equal to zero. n double equals to zero actually performs the comparison you want. And so remember that that's another potential pitfall in your code. But if you turn on all the compiler that we'll have for you for your next week tutorials, hopefully this won't be an issue as you'll get a warning that tells you you're about to do this. And we'll have to save that demo for later. Um, and before we finish off, the last thing I want to show you today is a piece of real code that was inside Apple's operating system. This was code that was actually checking for the validity of security certificates that were used to protect internet communications. Now, uh, can anyone see a problem with this line of code? And there's a chocolate in it for you if you can. Yara. That is 100% correct. And let me grab chocolate for you. There we go. So Yara point, pointed out that these things are, these if statements are all in block without curly braces, which means that for something to be attached to the if, it has to be a single statement following an if and then ended by a semicolon. However, after the second if, there are two go-to fails in a row. The first one is attached to the if. The second one is just on its own. The fact that C is white space independent means you can indent it that way, but that doesn't mean that it's actually attached. And so what would happen is this would always go to the fail condition, which led to a large security vulnerability in the in the Mac OS operating system. Yes, this was patched years ago. I think this was something like 2016. So the things we're teaching you are real problems in real code. And I think with that, we are good for today. I will catch you all tomorrow and hopefully we'll have the microphone so we'll have a little more interaction. Thanks everyone. <laughs>